Hey everybody, Charles from HumbleMechanic.com. Today, I'm going to be taking your questions on VR6 engines, GoPros, adaptive cruise control, and more. This is episode 131 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. All right, so to get a question on a show like this, email me, charles at HumbleMechanic.com, and be sure, be sure, be sure to put question for Charles in the subject. Also, you guys have been doing an awesome job by asking the question, mashing the enter button a couple of times, and then putting the details down below. That really does help me, so thank you guys so much for that. So a couple other things before we get into the show. I've been getting so many questions, which is awesome. Thank you guys so much for all the questions. The only problem is we have limited time to do these kind of shows, so I need some help. What do you guys think? I want to get more questions done. I'm thinking either adding a second Q&A show to the week's set of shows, or what other thing I was thinking of is basically just taking my phone and sort of shooting some raw Q&A stuff on the fly, maybe at work or something like that, and then just directly uploading them to YouTube, not editing and none of that, so more of you guys can get your questions answered, because I really hate that I can't get all of these questions on shows. So throw it down in the comment sections on what you guys think is going to be the best way to get more questions answered, because remember, these Q&A shows especially are all about you guys. All right, before we get to your questions, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals on a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, AC components, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory Volkswagen and Audi DSG fluids. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. All right, let's get into the questions. First one comes from Mario. Have you ever made use of GoPro cameras or other makes to view suspension components or even engine bay components as a diagnostic test drive. Uh, Mario, awesome question. I actually have one time. We were doing some diagnostic on my boss's daughter's Jeep and he had some kind of vibration or something. So I put two GoPros up underneath to monitor the suspension while the vehicle was driving. And it worked okay. The only problem is, uh, at the time especially, we didn't have the computing power to really dissect that video, especially on our work computers, it's all cloud-based stuff. They're horrible. They're horrible, horrible, horrible. It's terribly slow. So we didn't really have the computing power at work to break that video down. And in fact, really back then, I didn't have it at home either. So I'm gonna try and find that video and hopefully you guys are watching this video while I'm talking because it's awesome. Look, these, these shots are very, very cool. And it's neat to be able to see these components while they're live and in action. You know, when it comes to different types of diagnostic styles, like the GoPro, for example, it's such a new relative thing that I think a lot of people really discount it. I think using a GoPro to watch something while you're driving or, you know, a little audio recorder to try and record noises are both really incredible diagnostic tools. They're powerful tools. They work incredibly well. You know, we use my Zoom H1 to record some kind of noise on a car months and months ago and sent it over to Volkswagen Techline. And, and it was awesome that we could you know, take that and record it. We had it on a, on a pole, like a, a monopod pole, sort of outside the car. I was listening with my headphones. And it was a great way to monitor the noise from a different location that you never really would if you were just trying to listen with your ears. So I think it's awesome. If you guys have any tips on using different types of equipment, you know, the cell phone's kind of a slam dunk one. I use it obviously all the time. You guys have seen a ton of my videos shot with my cell phone. Um, that's a great one, but there are a ton of other things that we really don't consider when it comes to, you know, different ways to diagnose cars. So Mario, awesome question. I hope that sort of inspires somebody else to maybe do things a little bit differently. All right, next one comes from Henry. Is it necessary to replace the serpentine belt tensioner when installing a new belt and vice versa when replacing the tensioner? My belt on my 1.4 TSI has a squeak when it's cold. I assume it's the rubber that gets harder when it's cold and slips. It's more annoying now in the winter time, so I've decided to replace it. When I told the dealer about the squeak, they gave me a price for two belts and the pulley for the alternator. Should I look at these parts as well? Thanks, Henry. P.S. How's your daughter? Haven't heard anything in a while. Um, dude, thanks for asking about the little one. She's awesome. It's, uh... Crazy to see her growing up so fast, and uh, you know she hangs out on all the shows here with us, and uh, she'll be one in like a few weeks, which is just <sighs> mind blowing, right? Um, so thank you guys very much for asking about that. I really do appreciate it. Um, as far as the serpentine belt and tensioner and, and pulley on the alternator, this is another question that it really all depends. If I were replacing a serpentine belt as maintenance, say it's cracked or something like that, I wouldn't put a tensioner on it. But what I would do with the serpentine belt off is 
take my hand and spin all the rollers and see what they feel like. Do they spin freely? Do they make noise? You know, you'll probably get a little noise out of most tensioning rollers or rollers or pulleys or whatever, but I would spin them all and make sure that there's nothing really crazy going on. If I'm doing this for a noise, uh, you know, I probably, I, I don't know, it depends. Again, it depends. Uh, if I'm putting the belt on myself, I would put the belt on and see if the noise went away. If I was paying someone to do that, there is going to be overlap with doing the belt and a tensioner and a roller. You know, you mentioned the uh, alternator pulley. That one is a really common noisemaker, especially on the TDIs. Uh, there's a clutch inside of it that'll lock up in one direction and freewheel so you can take it and it'll only like hard turn one way but if you sort of flip it back like this it'll actually freewheel a little bit back the other way you know i have one at the shop i need to cut open and do a video for you guys because it's a really cool little thing and when they fail they they make a very distinct screeching noise a lot of times it's under heavy load so like hard turns you know with the steering wheel almost all the way to the lock they'll make a little bit extra noise but Back to your question, just straight, like do you always as a part of a repair? No, if I'm just putting a serpentine belt on it, I just put a serpentine belt on it. Now the other side, the vice versa side, if I'm putting a tensioner on it, I'm probably gonna do a belt as well. Because if I'm doing a tensioner, I'm doing a tensioner for a reason, some sort of failure, some sort of noise, something like that. So I feel like, you know, belts are kind of maintenance anyway, we're right there anyway. What kind of noise do we have? Is it the belt skipping on the roller? Is it extra wear on the belt? You know, belts aren't terribly expensive for the most part. Again, like I mentioned, the labor's gonna overlap. If I were doing a tensioner, I'd put a belt on it. If I was just doing a belt, I wouldn't put a tensioner on it. All right, next one comes from Craig. I love my GLS. It gets 27 miles to the gallon per tank. Five-speed manual, decent radio, VR6 power. It has 208,000 miles on it the original clutch, the original catalytic converter, and timing chain. The clutch is starting to go, the check engine light, and the check engine light and codes tell me it's finally time for a new catalytic converter. How much should I expect to pay to get all this stuff and any other stuff you think I should make sure is done to keep it for another three to five years? All right, Craig, awesome question on your 01, which I think I left out, 01 Jetta. So this is a 12 valve VR6. This is a very, very similar engine to the two VR6s that I have sitting on the other side of the camera. Awesome job on getting 208,000 miles, man, on, on all that stuff original. That's fantastic. I've seen a whole lot of other cars that would be on their third clutch by now and, and you know, fifth catalytic converter. So bravo to that. Um, you got a cat, you got a clutch. Those are the two main things. If you're doing the clutch, you're going to absolutely 100% want to do timing chains on it. You're like 80% of the way to the timing chains. It's going to be a little bit more labor, but the bulk of that job is pulling the transmission out. So if you're getting the transmission pulled out in order to replace the clutch, you have to take the clutch off to do the timing chains anyway. Go ahead and get it all done. That is like the most important thing, I think, out of all the things you mentioned, and the best overlap as well. So you got a clutch, probably do pressure plate flywheel, timing chain set, um, you got a catalytic converter fault. There's a couple of ways you can go with a cat. You can do the OE style cat. Those generally run in the $800 to $1,200 price range for parts only. Labor is, you know, a couple hours probably at this point. So call it $1,500 just to throw out a rough number. That's not terrible. You can do other things and get a cheaper cat. You can get aftermarket cats. You can get weld-in cats. Depending on the quality, though, of one, the part, and two, the uh, installation, I've seen aftermarket cats not really work out so well where they'll, like, last for six months or something like that. So, you know, there's, there's other options other than the OE cat, but the OE cat, and this is how I want you to think about it, the OE cat has lasted you 208,000 miles. You know, 16 years of driving and 208,000 miles, it's a long time for a catalytic converter. So, for me, unless I was going performance, I would probably get a factory cat again because you've seen you've seen how good these cats can be, and um, if you can get another hundred thousand miles out of it, it's worth the you know fifteen hundred bucks that you would spend. So let's call it fifteen hundred for the cat. The clutch really depends. You know, you could do clutch, pressure plate, and flywheel from someone like Black Forest for like six or seven hundred dollars for the parts. They may not even be quite that expensive. You are going to want to make sure you do a release bearing as well while you're right there. That's an absolute must for me whenever I'm doing a, a clutch job is that it gets a release bearing. It's one of those like doing a water pump with a timing belt. It just makes perfect sense to do it. 
Um, so call that another $600 in parts. Timing chain kits. I've actually been looking for a timing chain kit for my VR6. You can find them as low as like 200 bucks to 300 bucks. It really all depends on OE versus aftermarket parts. You know, those parts have been around a long time, so I wouldn't necessarily say no to aftermarket parts on those. In fact, I'm pretty sure I put aftermarket in the cabbie when I rebuilt that engine, so I wouldn't shy away from that there. So call that another $300. You're almost at a thousand, so now we're at what, 2,500 bucks? Uh, plus labor to pull the transmission and do the chains. It's probably gonna be about 10 hours, so call that another thousand bucks. So, you, 3,000 bucks maybe, depending on where you take it and how much their labor rate is. You know, that's not bad, man. If you could spend three grand and get another two, three, four years out of this car, that's a better choice, in my opinion, than taking $3,000 and buying a $3,000 car. You know, you've owned this car for a long time. You know the history of it. You buying another car, you have no idea what's been done, what needs to be done, the issues. At least this one, you already know, hey, I got a few issues. It's going to take some work to get them fixed, some money to get it fixed, but then you'll know, okay, if I get these really important things fixed, I still have a really good quality car. So if it costs three grand to 3,500 bucks, I may not do it all at once. You know, I may space the cat and the timing chain clutch job apart a little bit, but that's a better way to go, in my opinion, than just trying to find something else. And I know you didn't ask about the finding something else, but I figured I'd throw that in there because oftentimes we do have to make that determination on cars that are that age, do we spend a chunk of money on this car and fix it? Or do we take that chunk of money, sell our car, have a little bit more and buy a different car? So in, in my opinion on this one, I'd put the money into the Jetta and rock and roll, man. All right, next one comes from Adam. I have a 2.0 TSI BPY 2006. I have one problem I'd like to ask if you can please help me. Vagcom shows me a fault Bank One System 2 lean at idle P2187. Check engine light is on. So is this something with fuel? I've changed the spark plugs, oil, oil filter, air filter, timing belt, cam follower, and seal on the high pressure pump. Clean the intake manifold flaps, put new seals on it, change the electric driver, new PCV valve, change solenoid valve to N80. This failure shows once a day on check engine light and check with VAGCOM. What could this problem be? Thanks, I appreciate your answer and advice, Adam. Um, Adam, so you have a system lean fault on a BPY engine. First, I'm gonna link up a video I, again, I forget which side it links up on. I'm gonna link up a video. Check out the video that I did diagnosing my Passat for a system lean fault and use that as a guide. Now, it's a totally different generation, but you have VAGCOM, so you have access to information that some other people don't. Go in and watch that video and that'll give you some value blocks, you know, measuring value block 32 specifically, uh, to look at and see just how lean this system lean issue really is. Now, I've seen a few things cause this where, you know, it's, it's either basic or sort of really in depth. You have system lean, which means the vehicle's not seeing enough fuel, which means that the vehicle's adding fuel. So when you go to that measure value block 32, you're going to see a positive number in field one. Field one is at idle, field two is off idle. So you're gonna see a positive number, and that'll give you an idea of just how much fuel the vehicle's adding. If it says 0.10, or 0.2, or 0.3, or 3.0, you're not really changing that much. It's not adding that much fuel. If you see five, six, seven, eight, 10, 12, 25, now you got a situation where it's dumping a ton of fuel. You also wanna look at the off idle number and sort of see where that's at. Is that also adding fuel? Are we taking away fuel? That can sort of point you in the direction if it's adding fuel at idle and off idle, a lot of times we look at maybe the airflow meter or the oxygen sensor. You know, oxygen sensors usually die reading lean from my experience, not always. They'll die reading lean, which means the ECM just pegs the fuel out and pours fuel in it. So it'll, it'll usually peg those two numbers out to, I think, plus 25 is, uh, is the max. So a couple other things you can look at. Where you replace that N80 valve, follow it up. There's a T fitting with a check valve. One side goes to the vacuum pump one side goes down to the area where the N80 valve is, and I think the other one goes to an intake manifold pipe. That cracks all the time. They break a lot. It's that plastic, kind of molded plastic over a barbed fitting. They break all the time, check that. Also, check the two lines to the brake booster. There's gonna be one from that area where that pipe is that I just had you check, down to right below the coolant flange. It's actually part of the coolant flange through the flange and then back up to the brake booster, which is just behind the vehicle battery. 
check that as well. Those are the really two common air leak areas on that BPY. We also wanna look for any oil leaks. The BPY is not as sensitive to oil leaks as the CCTA, but it can be. And I have also seen injectors cause this issue. So keep that in mind as well. We also wanna make sure that if we don't find anything in that space, we're looking at what our low side fuel pressure is. Most of the time with fuel pressure though, you don't get a system lean only. You'll get a low fuel rail pressure or something like that. Because remember the low side fuel, if it's not there, it's gonna affect the high side fuel. So normally, I'm not too worried about that. Normally you get more issues that do say fuel, fuel rail or fuel pressure, something like that. So with system lean faults, remember it's always best to start with a visual inspection and make sure that you don't have a vacuum leak because that is really gonna be the most common cause across the board for a system lean fault. So best of luck to you, Adam. I hope you are able to find it. And hey man, when you do, post it up and let us know what you found. All right, next one comes from Andrew. I have an 86 Cabriolet and I've been doing a lot of thinking about a VR6 engine swap. My main concern is all the wiring. I know I can buy the wiring harness from Eurowise, but I'm still confused about how it will work. And speaking of Eurowise, there are a bunch of other stuff they sell for the swap, including different stages of kits. What do you suggest I get? I'm not planning on turbocharging or doing anything particular to make it crazy fast, Andrew. So for you guys that are new to the show, um, I have an 88 Cabriolet with a VR6 engine swap. Uh, I used the Eurowise kit to install the engine. I actually bought my harness. Now, I know, go ahead and let the ridiculing flag because I bought the harness instead of making it, but at the time it was a time crunch thing and the boys up at Nothing Leaves Stock were awesome and helped me out and, and hooked me up on a good deal with a harness. So it was a time crunch thing. You know, going back, I would have done it myself. It's not hard, it's not a hard harness to build. It was just a time crunch thing. So Andrew, as far as the harness goes, the way mine is, it's basically a standalone harness. So the harness is built and the really the only thing you need to provide to it to make it work is power and ground. Remember that with this swap, we're removing the factory ECM and all the wiring in the engine compartment for the 1.8 and we're adding in the VR6. So we're basically building a standalone system. We're taking the ECM out of whatever car that you know the, the engine's coming out of we're taking the wiring harness and we're building a harness to basically just supply power and ground. That's all that it needs. It has the ECTs as part of the engine harness. It has, you know, the RPM sensor. It has the G28. It has all that on the engine and in the engine room harness. So the only thing we really, really need to do to make it work is provide power and ground. But of course, there's going to be other things that we want to make sure that work, you know, tack, check engine light, trigger signal, that kind of stuff. So it's going to be a matter of if you don't buy the harness, you'll just need to find the pins on the ECM connector and run them to the pins of the cluster if you're keeping your cluster from the Cabrio and not doing one from a, a Mark III or whatever engine and car this is coming out of. I left my Cabrio's cluster in. To be fair, I don't have any of that stuff hooked up because, well, I don't drive it that much, one, and two, I'm not terribly worried about it, and three, when I do need to look at some of these things, I'll generally just hook VADCOM up and monitor it with my cell phone or my uh, my my laptop, so I don't need that. You know, if I'm, I'm worried about speed, I actually built a speedometer cable for the car, so the speedometer works pretty well. It's a couple miles per hour off, but nothing nothing major, and that's just to give me an idea to make sure I'm not going 100 in a, in a 45, so. Don't sweat the wiring as much. Of course, the easiest way to do it is just to buy the harness. You know, the guys at Nothing Leaves Stock are awesome. They did a great job building this harness. They even sent me a little wiring diagram to go with it so I knew where the, the wires went. So awesome props to them. Um, Eurowise, I know at some point were selling that harness. I don't know that they still are. It may be like per order. Uh, you order it and then they build it for you. But let's go on to the kits. So when I first bought my kit, I got kind of the basic kit, the absolute minimum that you needed to bolt this engine in the car, which was a front mount, trans mount, engine mount, axles. And that was it. That was all that came in my kit. Um, I think now their stage one kit actually does come with the fourth mount, which mounts the trans to like the body of the car. I would absolutely make sure that I put that mount in. Um, that kit, even on stock horsepower VR6, does need that fourth mount. Uh, I ran into an issue where I bent the front mount because of the torque of the engine pulling back. So my front mount is now turned down just a little bit. Uh, not major, it doesn't cause any problems. It's not, 
you know, a big deal. It's just, it looks a little funny. And uh, you, nobody really would ever notice it unless I pointed it out. It, that happened, and I do have now the fourth mount in there. So I'd make sure I got the kit at least with all four of the mounts. Whether you're doing big horsepower or not now, it's going to be easier to get the kit that is going to suit a little bit more than you think you're going to do because as soon as I got that done and drove it around a little bit, I really wanted more horsepower, even though the car doesn't need it at all. Uh, you know, it's just one of those, I want more power type things. So um, get the kit that you is probably one higher than you think you might ever need. Again, that's going to be a lot easier. So I'll link up to the review I did on the kit that I got for my Cabrio from Eurowise. Uh, I love the guys at Eurowise. They're awesome to deal with. They make great stuff. Good luck on that Cabrio build. I, you know, I tried to get Andrew to buy my uh, my Cabrio, but uh, but he wasn't having it. So if you change your mind, man, let me know. I'm really kicking around selling the car. All right, next up. Do you find you need a pickup truck to be a mechanic? I'm looking at buying a new car and I'm just about to start my first job as a tech. I have a fairly large toolbox and was wondering how you transport everything around. Do you find it necessary for transporting parts and tools to have a pickup truck or do you find a wagon or SUV sufficient? Um, great question. So I never really knew how much I needed to have a pickup truck until I didn't have a truck. Uh, we used to have a 2008, I think, Nissan Frontier. Awesome little truck. My wife loved it. We traded it because we couldn't put a car seat in it. Uh, so we now have the Tiguan. I, I think that everybody should have a truck because trucks are so awesome. They get good fuel economy today. They're so handy, they're so versatile. You know, you throw whatever you want in the back and, and rock and roll. In fact, as soon as the lease is up on the Tiguan, we are going to be getting another truck. Now, do you need it? Now, of course you don't need it. Um, you know, I don't move toolboxes around very much. And once you get your job at the dealership, you're not gonna either. In fact, for the most part, when you're ready to move your box, a couple of things, you're probably gonna rent a trailer, which is gonna be a thousand times easier than putting a toolbox in the back of the truck or you're gonna have a tow truck, take your toolbox, strap it up, and tow it to wherever you go next. For parts, trucks are great. You don't have to worry about getting you know, the interior of your car dirty, but it's not necessary. And uh, remember, you guys can always like rent a U-Haul truck, rent a U-Haul van, if you know, like you need to make a run out to the pull apart or something and, and get an engine say, you can rent that and, and not worry about it for 50 bucks or whatever. So mandatory no, absolutely awesome. And do I recommend it? 100% yes. All right, next one comes from Steven. Is it possible for an owner slash driver to temporarily disable adaptive cruise control and revert to traditional cruise control on a 2016 Passat? I took my 2016 Passat on its first winter road trip and ACC stopped working when the front of the car became covered in a quarter inch to three eighths inch of ice and snow. The MFI indicated the ACC sensor was not available. Having read the owner's manual in bold text, thank you, Steven. Uh, after I got the car, I knew about the bad weather could impact the ACC operation. What I didn't expect was that there was no fallback to traditional cruise control. After stopping and cleaning off the front end of the car, the ACC worked normally. Um, Steven, I actually don't know the answer to this question, and I was going to have you revert to your owner's manual, but thank you for jumping ahead of me and doing that as a wonderfully smart and responsible vehicle owner. So good job there, man. Um, I don't know. Uh, in my brain, it's stupid that it wouldn't. You know, I think the Torag, you actually have to turn on the adaptive cruise control. It's not automatic. So you have to tell it, I want adaptive cruise control. I'll tell you what I am going to do, though, is in the next couple of days at work, I'm going to jump in a Passat and I'm going to test drive one and see what happens. And, uh, you know, if, if there is not a way to easily disable it, I'm going to do some research for you and see what I can find out. Because that's one that, to me, sounds weird that it wouldn't. The other side of that though, is let's say you disable it and stop and get gas and your significant other jumps in and drives it and is expecting it to work. That's kind of the situation where I would say there's not a way to disable it because the next driver may assume that it's going to have it and rely on it to regulate speed and then it doesn't and you, know, you paint the story of what happens after that. Uh, but I don't know, man. The uh, Straight up, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I'll tell you what, I will find out the answer for you. All right, got time for one more. This one comes from Mike. I have a 2015 Passat TDI. The ECM was update was applied without owner's authorization. Immediately, 10 to 20% reduction in fuel economy. This is the Service Action 2309. My question is, can the ECM update be backed out? Um, Mike, the official answer is going to be no. Um, it is what it is. There's not really 
bear with me now, not really a way to back that software down to the old version of the software. We've had this happen a couple of times, and out of all of the Passats that we've updated, out of all the Golf Jetta Beetle TDIs we've updated, we've had two customers have this issue. We looked into the Passat a little more than we did on the Jetta Sport Wagon. Actually, I take that back. I really looked into that Jetta Sport Wagon, filled the tank, drove it 100 miles, did a fuel mile calculation, and figured out that it was still exactly where that fuel economy should be for that vehicle. Uh, same thing with the Passat. We looked into thermostat issues and ECT issues and didn't find anything out of the ordinary. Out of all of the software updates that we've seen at the dealership, I have seen one, one time, the software get backed down to the previous version. And that was something that we had to dial up to Volkswagen. The folks at Volkswagen Corporate logged into our computer, blacked out our screen, and did whatever they did and put it back to the software level. And the reason they did that was not a fuel economy concern, it was not a drivability concern. It was on the 24AX, which is a two liter turbo update or newer two liter turbo update, it kept getting intake manifold faults. And we put you know, three intake manifolds on, did an overlay, nothing seemed to work. We could never duplicate the failure of the intake manifold flap runner. So Techline backed the software down. But hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, recent ECM updates, and we've had one where that was an option. So officially Volkswagen stance is going to be, we're not gonna back the software level down. And I know you, it looks like you had went through the ch proper channels with Volkswagen and with the dealership, and they kind of told you the same thing. So unfortunately in that space, there's really not a solution to backing the software level down or back to its previous version. But what you can do is look at getting a tune. Check out Malone and see if they have a tune available for your car. You know, depending on what state you're in, that may be less than legal, we'll say. One of my first steps would be to get it tuned because that does open up your fuel economy. That does increase your horsepower. It does increase your torque. It may have, you know, impacts in other spaces like warranty and whatnot, but you already have an issue with your fuel economy. I would look at getting it tuned. I wouldn't go nuts. I wouldn't do a DPF delete and all this other stuff, stage three tune, turbo, any of that. I would do a stage one tune and monitor how your fuel economy is because you can always go back. You can always go back to the level that it was before and, and you know go to that updated 2309 software but not back to the original. But you can always take the tune off is, is my point. Um, that's what I would do. And does it suck? Yeah. Is it cool that the dealership did a software update on your car without asking you? No, it's not cool. In fact, one of the things about these software updates is we are supposed to get authorization on anything, really, any recall. We're supposed to get customer authorization before we do it. We've had more than one occasion where we've wiped out people's tunes by not asking them, hey, is your car tuned? So, Mike, I'm sorry about the situation, man. Again, I would look at having the ECM tuned aftermarket from someone like Malone, Unitronic, APR. There's a bunch of companies out there that do it. Depending on your location, I got a guy that uh, may be able to do it in Greensboro area, North Carolina. So let me know if you're local-ish there, and uh, I can talk to my buddy Ian at Reflect Tuning. In fact, I'll put a link to Reflect Tuning. Uh, major props to Ian, he's a good dude, so uh, I'll link up to him as well. But Mike, man, it sucks. I understand how you feel. I'm sorry that that's the way it is, but unfortunately, through the channels of Volkswagen, there's probably not a whole lot that they're gonna be able to do for you. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. If you have any questions or comments, post it in the comments section below. Hey, if you liked the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. I do always appreciate that. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at humblemechanic.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the blog, and obviously right here on YouTube. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. Drink of the day, because it's an early morning, is coffee.